Well, everyone, thank you for coming. Uh, today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about you know, the many things that you can do with Python and why I've chosen it as my language of choice. Um, maybe convince you that you might get to use it well. Uh, so before we start, how many of you have ever used Python to show hands? For those of you who have used Python on a scale of like you know, zero to five, zero being like I installed it, did some variables, and five being like I'm a complete expert. Throw me your hands, like, what's your level of comfort? <laughs> so, like, beginner, intermediate? Okay. Good to know. If ever I talk about something and it's not clear, please raise your hand throughout the talk. It won't be interrupted to me. Yeah. Would you give a number? <laughs> I don't know if anyone could ever be an expert. Even the creator of Python wouldn't call himself an expert, so that's a smart. Why <laughs> did you come to Python for us? I'll definitely come to that. Um, it was a breath of fresh air when I came. Okay. All right. So who, who am I? Um, I'm a senior software engineer contracting at Nike and a research associate at OHSU. I'm uh, doing both right now. Um, so yeah, just to give a little bit of background, I have kind of a non-traditional pathway uh, into software engineering. I started in college. Uh, with a cognitive neuroscience background, I went directly to OHSU from there, and I started in, in languages like MATLAB and R, uh, ePry and Presentation. They're all very scripted and have their own kind of like syntaxes. They're not easy to use, I would say, and they're not free. So that's something I'll get out when I talk about later. In the spirit of like having things be open source and accessible, um, they weren't, uh, and it's your tax dollars are paying for that research, right? And it just kind of sits on someone's computer. And I didn't really like that. Um, so I started there writing those scripts, and then one day I just found someone, someone's husband was at a software engineering place, and I was like, you know, I've done a lot of coding. Yeah, I think I could do this. And so I wrote them a cover letter that was like, you haven't even posted an internship, but I'm going to tell you why you should let me on. And like, that spoke to them, and they gave it to me. Um, very shortly after that, I was converted to a software engineer, and then a year after that, I started leading projects with people like iTunes. Microsoft, and that kind of started my career in software engineering. From there, I, I worked for startups in town. I worked right over in the Wells Fargo building, uh, and from there, Nike recruited me. And it was sort of like an ideal fit because I'm right next to their to the research lab. So I'm, make, I'm still doing software engineering, but it's in support of research. So it's kind of like a nice fit between the two. And then I would pull that back to OHSU. So I had all this passion about things being free and open source and using all these cool new technologies. So like I put my money where my mouth was, and uh, I made an open source library called BCI Pi, which I'll demo a little bit later, um, kind of bringing some of my ideals uh, into practice and what I do every day, so kind of bridging the two. Um, and what I kind of want to impart to you about Python is it um, it lets you solve the, the problems you want to solve. So like if, even if you're an enterprise or you're a hobbyist or somewhere in between, Python's got something. It kind of lets you do whatever you want. So what I've done, I went over a bit of my data science open source contributions, and I'll go over why I think the community is such like a cool, a cool thing to be a part of, and a lot of tools and web applications for enterprise. So overview. So first, I'm going to talk about after this, you know, why Python? Why did I choose Python? Why not C sharp, C plus plus? Why not JavaScript? Why not any of those things? There's a lot of choices, and I'm sure. Those of you who are in the boot camp here, you kind of start to think about where should I put all my time? You know, where should I invest myself? Um, and maybe immediately it might be whatever gets me my first job, but and that's totally fine. <laughs> I completely understand. But as you start to like go into the community and you can start developing your own opinions, and you can kind of kind of move in that direction. Um, I'll, then I'll start to go over popular libraries. I'm going to focus on the areas that I'm familiar with, so I'll go over popular lines for science, data visualization, web development, application development. I'll have a few demos, but I'm going to keep it pretty high level. Um, and it is no, by no means an exhaustive list of what is available in Python, um, but I'll, um, I'll talk more about that later. And then, so right after that, I'll talk about like how do you choose the right tool. There are so many available. How do you pick the right one? How do you know what to do? Um, and I'll, I'll kind of close with that. And then I'll leave some time for Q&A. Again, feel free to raise your hand. Or if something's not clear, 
ですだけで。So why Python?、Um, it's a high level language with many tools. You guys know what it means to be high level? What, what does it mean for a language to be high level? It's more human readable generally. Like the closer you get to. So, depending on the application you make, you may have a back end you can manage in Python, but you don't have to manage memory as much. You don't have to necessarily manage your garbage collection. It kind of does it for you. And the syntax is, like, as you were saying, more human readable. So maybe as you get down to C sharp, you have to initialize variables, or you have to do all of these things. But the number, the lot, number of lines of code that you have to write to do something like just print you now is much more verbose than you can do in Python. It's you're, free. You're further and further away from the assembly line. Yes. Yeah. And let's talk about the trade off of that for a little bit. Right? So, like, the higher you go up, generally people will say the slower it goes. Um, that's maybe not necessarily true, but it, it's super relative, right? Like, we're talking milliseconds, nanoseconds for some of these things. You want to choose the right language for whatever application you're going to use.、Um, and this is my favorite quote from Python I went in 2017. Why don't you use C instead of Python? Why don't you commute by airplane instead of car? You know, sometimes it's just the wrong language for what you're trying to do. I have some funny slides later because it's going on all the time.、Um, so, it's popular in research and industry. Based on Stack Overflow, they do developer surveys every year. You know, there are tens of thousands of people who, who do that. It's consistently, in the last five years, been one of the fastest growing languages and rated one of the most enjoyable to work with and also the most desired. So, like, if your company doesn't currently use Python, they say, What would you use if you could? Python tends to be really up there. <coughs> MATLAB tends to be at the bottom. <laughs> it's not as, not as, not as good.、Uh, it has a rich developer community committed to open source. That might not be readily apparent to you as you're starting in your career, but you need those things. You need those like, developer forums. You want those like, really cool blog posts when you get stuck. You want people committing issues and fixing problems in your open source libraries. And if they don't, then it's not really going to give you as much out of it as you would want. I mean, you also want a community that's inclusive. So when I think about maybe Linux, As a just, juxtaposition to that, where it is known for being really hostile to newcomers, even adopting things like a, a contribution code of conduct that says simple things like, I'm not going to discriminate against age or race or any of those things. Just, it was like bottom of the barrel Reddit conversations, like everything <laughs> that you would hate from that.、Um, Python isn't like that.、Um, and even here locally, I can think of a few meetups I've been a part of. Hi, ladies, Jado Girls. They really welcome newcomers, intermediate. A nice community and a group of people that you can talk with and, and learn and get you know, new jobs. So, in that way, it's really g o o d On the technical side, it likes to appease a lot of different audiences. We, we want to give pathways from other languages, so we, we kind of just, as Python people, try to appease everyone. So, it can be object oriented programming, which you may or may not have learned about yet, or it can be functional. Which you may have heard in reference to JavaScript. You could do all of the same things in Python. It's just maybe not as well publicized. You could do callbacks and all of those things with the, the, the nice things you would get from JavaScript.、Um, and you can see where they see your lines on the Android program and then scoff it. And it, there are a lot of like,、uh, scientists who are writing papers on why you should use functional. Some mathematicians and the like prefer functional programming. OOP, I mean, CS in general for a lot of sciences, it's, it's, it hasn't breached in the way I'd like. So, I'm going to show you guys is you can do things in a lot of ways. There's a lot of libraries, but we're starting to breach the two, you know, because things like test coverage, structure, they're all really important for the maintainability of whatever code you're doing versus like an 800 line script that you're passing around from one person to the other. So, there's a lot to be learned. I would really encourage you all to try both and form your own opinions. Like, as you go on,、um, 
I don't think there's a wrong answer. I think there are certain problems that benefit from a functional perspective, especially in the front end. Um, whereas like OOP, yeah, it really just depends on the problem that you're solving. Again, I talked about fast growing and it's enterprise. What do I mean by enterprise? What comes to mind? Large company. What does the code mean by enterprise? Though? I mean, definitely. Scalable, scaling. Any other? Okay. Secure. Secure. That's super that's very important. Error handling. Error handling. Yeah, I'm sure that's what we were talking about. I think scalable is a good one, and if you're not aware of what that means, it means like it can distribute across uh, you know large portions of, of the country, and it can do so without much downtime. It's reproducible. So we, you guys have all probably had the experience of like making something on local host and it works and then you try to give it to your friend and it doesn't. <laughs> um, when you think about enterprise level, someone's paying you for what you're giving them. And so like it would kind of encompass everything that you would want out of a paid product. You would want it to work, reproducible, you want it to have error messages, you know, all those things. And commercial quality. Yeah. Yeah. You should definitely have all of those things. Um, it's also, in, after Python 3, it can also be typed. So it, Python can both be a dynamic language, meaning I don't have to tell you it's a string or an integer. I can happily type away and do whatever I want, or I can type it. I can say this variable is a string, and its value is this. In an enterprise level code base, you might want something like that. Um, it might be easier to use, and you can do what are called like static type checks. So like when you run your test, if you try to input something that you shouldn't, it would throw an error. It wouldn't even let you deploy your code to your end user, so you can kind of see why that would be useful. Yeah, and it just seems like Python has a library for everything. Like, I have that funny comment over there. It's like, how are you applying Python? They just import an anti-gravity, and it just seems to work. <laughs> uh, and this is, so, this is so old. I got this when I was in high school, you can tell, because this is like Python 2. It's kind of sticky. It's a little bit more. All right, so you might have seen this before. It's kind of a joke we have, you know, the front end's always so pretty and everyone sees it on the back end like this horrible monster. And like, going back to, well, what if I need something really fast? And, you know, Python just isn't gonna cut it for me. Well, I would actually say, you know, have your, your low logo code, you know, written, but have Python be the interface for it. So that way when your users are actually using your Python code, they could say something like start app and they don't have to worry about compiling C and doing everything. And the way that they interact with it is happy rainbows. And they don't have to worry about the millions of lines of C++ that you've written. It, it could just be the interface. Um, I tend to think of things like um, Elasticsearch. What it uses under the hood is actually written in Java. But there are plugins for you to express yourself in Python. And most people are using the clients, not All right, so let's get into some of my favorite scientific libraries. Um, these are just things you will hear all the time. And I'm going to like selfishly self-promote my library uh, down at the bottom, and I'll show you guys that. So you will hear, you will hear about these if, if you do anything. Um, so SciPy uh, is an open source tool for mathematics and scientific computing. And they all kind of use each other, by the way. So like, if I was making a project where I was going to say, I want to process this data and visualize it and do all these things, you're probably going to use a combination of some of these libraries. Uh, NumPy is more close to MATLAB, so it allows you to do like matrix and array manipulation and all of the functions that you would want to handle those sort of things. Panda is very similar. More data manipulation and analysis of tables and time series data. And when I'm talking about interfaces, you know, pandas, it has something like read CSV, read text file, and you just give it your path. And it knows how to parse it and how many headers to deal with. So you don't have to write your Python code that says, with this thing open, parse this, skip this line. You just get a focus on the thing that you wanted to do, which is reading your data and do something with it. Uh, Anaconda is a, is a platform to use all of these things. So it's like a, a GUI that comes up. You can use pandas, sci-fi, numpy, but you can also uh, distribute like data science workflows uh, that way. So that's how you know promoting the open source kind of feel to it. Jupyter, um, who actually just won an award by ACM for being one of the more innovative things for Python, is an interactive notebook for 
you would work with your Python, it's still scripted. So it's not something you would use to, you know, like we were talking about enterprise a ago. You wouldn't just change this to enterprise. But if I had my own personal data analysis project, or if I just wanted to play around with something, um, you might use that. So let's see. So before I got here, because I'm a last minute person, uh, all I had to do was pip install Jupyter. That's all I've done. And now I can do Jupyter Notebook. It opens up uh, in your browser, and you would say, I want to make a new notebook. And you type on create. And this is the interface that you get. And you can do things like Maybe I just want it to tell me what I do. It will give you an output. But maybe you also have plots, and you want to like go step by step and like visualize the data. And then what happens when I do this? And what happens when I do that? Well, let's get an example of plots. So if I just Google, which I did, uh, plotting a sine wave using matplotlib, uh, let's just take an example code right here. And all it's doing is importing map plot lives, and that's a library we're going to talk about here in a second, foreshadowing a bit. It's going to give you some like time values to make your sign, and then it's going to plot it. So let's see what that looks like. Keep it in the so like in the line, I can see you know, both the output from this block and then the output from this block. And I could keep adding things, and I could do things with the same data. But I could also share this notebook with someone. I could host it. And so you can see how that might be useful between data scientists uh, when you're, yeah, it's kind of nice. It's interactive. Yeah. So that is Jupyter. All right, some buzzword sort of things. So TensorFlow is, is made by Google. It is uh, made for uh, making machine learning models. You can do really, really fast data manipulation and processing. So is scikit-learn, you know, more for making those models. Um, learn a lot about machine learning and AI. You could just you know, hip install one of those libraries, set up your data, and have a model that's running. So it's pretty simple to get up and running. If you just had a question about, I want to make a machine learning model to predict the sentiment of somebody's tweet. It might be pretty easy for you to set that up. Um, yeah. PsychoPy is one that I used a lot. It's like, uh, it's made for psychological research. So it does everything from control your graphics card to give you stimuli on the screen. It like, gives you timing, it triggers, it interfaces with hardware that psychologists and neuroscientists might uh, want to be aware of, like button boxes or other triggers or joysticks, that kind of stuff. So it allows you to interface in that. And it also has a GUI. So you could either be programmatic and say, import PsychoPy, do this, or you can use their experiment builder. Um, and that was a huge thing for, for people in, in the sciences. Because for a long time, we were using ePrime in presentations. Again, not free, really hard to use. Um, so this is a really good step in the, in the right direction. And the PCI Pi is something I've been working on for the last two years. I presented it at the Brain Computer Interface Conference uh, in California this year. Uh, and it's one of those libraries meant to simplify what it would take for you to have a successful brain-computer interaction. And what I mean by that is, you know, in my case, you wear an EEG cap, you have some letters flashing on the screen, and you can type with your thoughts. That is definitely hands down my passion right now. Um, and I've been working on that for a while. Yeah. So was that anything I have complete ignorance about this question? Stephen Hawking. What did, did he use something similar? He had his own preferences. He's an interesting figure in the BCA community. He kind of like hoarded his own stuff. Um, but he tended to use like eye trackers or switches. So there's a lot of communication methods already available for people with uh, muscular degenerative disorders. Um, this one is definitely would benefit the later stages. And if you don't know what ALS is, it's, it's, not, it's like being locked in. You know, being locked into your body, still having the full mental capacity that you had before your injury or your degeneration, and having no way to communicate that. Um, so these sort of technologies are you know, really would benefit that community. But there's also a large gaming community and things like that around. You could imagine 
VR and things like that. Um, yeah, there's a lot of cool things you can do with that. And let me show you these games. So first, let me show you. So this is the structure. And like as you're going into your careers, definitely think about what makes it the easiest for someone new coming in, what makes it modular, what makes it easier um, to do changes in one module and not the other, and for things to happen as you would like. We've structured it in this way. Um, let me show you the GUI. So this is a simple GUI I made with WX Python again. I'll talk about that a little bit later. Someone might say, I want to do RSVP. That's a paradigm of PCI where I just flicker things rapidly in front of your face, and then when your brain recognizes the target, it will react, and then you will uh, type that one to free. Uh, in order to begin, though, you have to do some sort of uh, calibration. Tab, tab. You can edit your parameters here. Let's say I want to so this is made in Psychopy again. I am not making it full screen, so you can kind of see everything that's happening in the background. Everything here is being logged. So this is the calibration paradigm. You're looking for the letter Z. Your target's O. Now you're looking for the letter L. You have to do that a hundred times. Because I'm going to have to make some sort of model to tell me what does target look like when your brain wants it and what does not target look like. Right. So let's say you go through all hundred of those. You can see I'm also uh, exporting the timestamp of when that occurred. That's how I'm going to be able to later say, like, I have this raw data, but I also have these times when these letters were presented. And you use those to parse your data and then put them into your model. After you're done, you would calculate the AUC, which is like me making my model. And then I could go on to spell with my brain once, once the successful comes. Um, and what output? So here's the test tab user that I just made. Here's the, the run. Has everything from my raw data, which it's fake data right now. I obviously don't have any UV cap of that, so we have a generator. Here's my triggers as they happen. This is when the calibration trigger happened, the first presentation of the station. Um, and everything that you would need to actually work with it. So this is really important. Again, going back to open source, if I gave someone my data file, I want to make sure that they know exactly what to do with it, how to load it, what it should look like. And I don't want them to have to think about it. I don't want them to make their own scripts. Um, so it's definitely an easy fact. So, yeah. so you do this, the user interface also uses Python? Yes, everything here is Python. We have one Dockerized container, which needed Python too. So yes, everything, everything is in Python. The GUI, the back end, the data processing, the modeling, everything. Very cool. Speaking of like two and three, if you had nightmares with upgrading, and then I guess the side question is when you're selecting new libraries, is there a resource you use for maybe vetting them to come up with these tools? Yes, and that will be at the very end. Oh. Uh, okay. Great foreshadowing. Um, two to three, there are libraries with Python distributed once they said, and they had had Python three out for a decade, and nobody was switching. They were like, I thought typically they're like, do whatever you want, it's okay. And then there were lots of pain points, right? Because then those libraries had to support two and three, and the syntax was bad. The ecosystem was starting to like turn against Python, and they said, I think it's coming up, but we're going to pull the plug on two pretty soon in the next few years. So people are finally starting to do their migrations. There is a library called Python two to three. And it'll kind of give you a heads up, like, what kind of things should I change? Where are my issues? You know, point you in the right direction. I've had some nightmares. Like, they're <laughs> um, But usually it's more about the way the person wrote their code than about the issue of Python. It was just hard to find uh, what was going on. Any more science questions? No, oh, obviously, we need more time. Yeah. Have you used uh, BioPython at all in your work? No. I'll check it out. Though. There are so many libraries. Yeah. So I think exciting. it deals with a lot more genomics data. So I don't know. You you seem like you're a little bit on a different path than that. But it seems like it's a really well made uh, library for Python. 
Now let's get into data visualization. This is kind of where my career started. So like migrating over from MATLAB to Python, I started wanting to make my own plots. I wasn't really happy with Excel plots. They didn't look very good. Um, they weren't like production ready. Like people are, if you look at like Journal of Neuroscience and the kind of places that I want to be publishing, like some of their figures you would look at and be like, Um, so Matplotlib was one of the first ones, again, trying to appease lots of people. Matlab people wanted their plots. They were really easy in Matlab. Um, and they wanted the same features, the same syntax, the same ability. So Matplotlib, that's where we have it. Uh, and you saw one of those plots a second ago. It was that blue, not super exciting, but it did a good job. Um, it did a job. I'll give you an example of that. Bokeh is one of my favorites. The documentation isn't the best, but it really has a large like breadth of things that you can do. And I wanted to go to their website and show you. So with just this, you get that one. And you get a plot that like you can interact with and zoom in and save it as a PNG and refresh it. So you already have something that's interactive that you can export. This one looks pretty basic though, you know, the same as same as the map map plot is. Uh, oh, I want multiple lines. Well, that's getting kind of fancy. How much more lines is that? Not much. Hmm. And that's pretty expressive, right? Like, I have a figure. I want it to be line. I want it to be circle. I want the fill color to be this. So, like, when you're actually setting it up, the language that you're using is pretty apt, right? You kind of know what's going on. You can do things like, oh, this is cool. You have, like, large amounts of data. Select one or two points, or like let's say I want to like zoom in. Um, roll with this. You can do grid plots, which are my favorite, uh, mostly because I do a lot of like multiple observational studies. So I need to be able to do plots that show what happens over time, and um, those look pretty nice, right? As compared to the MATLAB plots that we just saw over here. You can do more than just basic line plots. And just to show you that it happens in real life, um, let's see. So here's a paper. Um, we're about to publish it in bio, we're going to try to get it published in biological psychiatry. It was a single person study. They were in the OR during an awake craniotomy. So they were awake, their brain was exposed, and we had like a grid on top of their brain. Um, Okay, so this is what they gave me. So we had the experiment, they had the things on top of their brain. We had two conditions. One in which they were just resting, not doing anything, and the other one they were meditating. And what we were interested in is what brain regions, what changed when someone was in a meditative state versus a non-meditative state. So we're looking at these different frequency bands, we're processing all these things. This is what I got back from the postdoc. This is a lovely chart. And we could have published with these. We could have mocked them. There's nothing wrong. But instead, I decided to use Bokeh, make a grid plot using all the things that's before, and how much nicer did that look? That is much more publication ready. And it only took me, like, I'm going to show you guys the script there. It took me, like, 10 minutes to write. But of course, like, as you're learning, you're not going to know what things to type in. But I don't think it would take anyone more than an hour to, to replicate this. So this is all the code that I It does everything from like compile all my papers. I don't know if any of you have used uh, Cheat Tinter. It is another GUI library that I'm not going to talk about. It's like a Python built in GUI library. But I do use it for things like I need uh, a file explorer. Like, a, you know, like I want to choose uh, a window to select, and I don't want to have to program that GUI. And I'll show you what that looks like. So for this one, I want it to, whatever CSV that I give it, I want it to generate those grid plots. So if I run my code, the first thing that it's going to give me is this explorer. That's what tkinter is going to give me. 
from those like really nice like native things to like choose your um, your data. So instead of me having to hard code a path to my CSV and know where that was, I could just use this toolkit to kind of dynamically find those things, which is good. I know this is the data that I use. Okay, plot. Bam. Done. Move on with my data. But of course, there's a lot more. It does a lot of like geo plotting, heat maps, things like that. Those are all really popular things. They have a lot of like interactive examples on their website. It's pretty easy to get started. I really recommend it. A couple of others. Um, I don't use them as often. Seaborn, um, you can see. For a lot of these data viz packages, it really comes down to preference, like stylistically, what catches your eye, what you want, what kind of features that you want. Seaborn also allows you to do some like really cool time series streaming stuff really quick, like with maybe 15 lines of code. I just like input a streaming data source and it will just plot it for me and do scaling and yeah, lets me do other things with my time. Uh, Plotly Dash is one of those that if you're enterprise, you have to pay for it. But if you're just a hobbyist, you're for a nonprofit, thing like that, you can use it. Those are great plots, like really easy to use. Dash is a way for you to distribute it comes kind of packaged in there. So, is <coughs> main thing that you do 90% of what you want to do, a lot of you do for Mongo's code. Um, what things can you do to just make it that easy? In that pocket? Uh, honestly, Seaborn's, like, some of their marketing when it first came out was like, we're just like Mapplotlib. <laughs> we'll give you like prettier charts. Same with Bokeh, that was like their first like, hey, come on people, migrate over, we have some really cool things over here. Uh, and then they, Seaborn has a lot of the same interactive plots, like you can see someone brought up like genetics and stuff, I think it was you. Some of the plots that Seaborn has available just right out of the box can do a lot of those things. Um, so it really depends on your discipline and what you're interested in. Right, I'm just, so many data scientists Instead of, um, is there some really one of the reasons we want mostly yeah. we always think about what kind of things are better for mathematics specifically? Aesthetic. I think I think that's really automatic. Yeah. These are all so big and so well adopted that I don't think you should be having anxiety about choosing one or the other because they're well used, well adopted. What kind of chart do you want? Is it easy to actually do it in that language? Do they have support with it? Does it look the way that you want it to? Some of them are more or less configurable. Um, like Botley and Seaborn, some of their defaults might make a lot of assumptions, and then with being able to do like really custom things might be a little harder. So again, I think it's really about your preference there. Now let's go into web development. Um, on the other side of that, um, what kind of tools could you use to be developer. Uh, Django is probably one of my favorites. Um, their tagline is web, a web framework for perfectionists with a deadline. And so you can spin things up really fast. You go to their website, you download their base project, and you can have it up pretty quickly. Just pip install Django. It'll set up a database for you. It'll give you a, a model to start with, a view. And I don't know if you guys have learned about model controllers yet, but that's Couple of big clients: uh, Bitbucket, Instagram, NASA, The Onion, which is I love, uh, Spotify, YouTube, Washington Post, and Nat Geo. So it is enterprise ready, and it's also hackathon ready, right? So if you just want to put something together real quick and prove proof of concept, and you only have a weekend to do it, you might want to choose a library that has the tools available already that you know is secure. Right? So because this has such a big ecosystem, people already think. And I also mentioned Django Girls, so like talking more about like the community that you're contributing to in the long term. Uh, Django Girls is awesome. They do people coming from like very different back backgrounds, not necessarily tech. They do things like child care while you're there. They teach you, you know, all the things that someone would need to like get something out of that experience and not feel stressed out. It's very cool. You can use Flask. Um, you might have heard of Flask. It's a uh, 
it's more of a micro framework, so it doesn't have all the bells and whistles. It's not opinionated about anything, but it will give you a nice little restful, navigable like framework, I guess, to work with. But it's much smaller, much lighter weight, um, still useful. Um, another one that you're going to come across if you do any web development Python is the request library. Uh, their tagline is HTTP request for humans. Uh, <laughs> because it's hard to make those requests explicitly in Python. So you, the syntax would be request.get, tell it the website you want, auth equals, and that's pretty readable, right? Um, and that's what that library is taking care of. The other one that I'm, I really use a lot uh, is Selenium. Uh, Selenium is a web browser automation tool that allow you to do things like end-to-end -end testing of your front-end app with Python. It'll allow you to do things like web crawling. Does anyone know what web crawling is? Yeah. So web crawling and scraping is kind of what Google does. You know, in order to give you all the search thing, it'll go to that page, it'll get all of the text, it'll split it up into small bits, it'll make a model, and then next time you search whatever the website is, it'll be indexed there. Um, you might have other reasons for wanting to crawl. Let's say you want to buy Bitcoin when its price is the lowest, and you keep touching this site until something happens, and then you buy it, <laughs> and then you sell it. You can obviously. Let me show you how it works. So I made a file called Selenium Test. And this is all I will need to do to open Chrome programmatically. I'm not going to open it myself. I'm going to get python.org. I don't need this. This is the right there. Um, and then I'm, you can, if you've made HTML, you know things about like there's IDs and tags. You can use that syntax here. You can say, driver, get something by name, get something by ID, get something by class. And whatever the class name is, it will interact with that, with that item. And I can do things like set keys and hit enter buttons. So you can imagine I could open a website, log in to my website, and do every single interaction a person could possibly do. And I could assert that before I maybe distributed my website again, that it all worked. That way I don't have to have four or five QA testers doing every flow imaginable and maybe missing something. Um, so it's like, it's a big thing. But let's see it work. So it opened the window, went to Python org. It put something into that search bar and hit enter. It went too fast for you to see it. <laughs> but here's what it searched Python. And you could just keep doing that. Um, and you don't even need to know much about the site. You could just go to inspect and look for maybe unique IDs on the page. And you, that's how you would interact with it. Um, with the so you could see how that could be fun to play with, right? Kind of easy. Um, All right, so for application development, um, so yes, you might want a website. You may be working for someone who does website stuff. But also, maybe you want to make an app that you can distribute, like an EXE or something that you install on your Mac or just something that you know you run locally. Or maybe you want to make a PIP package. Maybe you want to make something that other people can use in their projects, kind of like what I did with UCI5. Um, so for application and local development, you're not going to want to use Django. That's made for web development. It's going to be too heavy for you're going to want to use something like Flask or to write your own in Python. Maybe it's just some scripts and things tied together on a GUI. That's fine. Um, let's say you want to make a user interface because most users don't like typing things into the command line. It's not super intuitive. Uh, WX Python is what I use to make the GUI uh, for BCI Pi, and I'll show you this in class. Hi, many of you want to make GUI. This is the GUI I made. This is only with the black line. And all I had to do was say bind action launch. Here's where I add my buttons and give it things like positions. It's pretty intuitive on how to use that, right? Um, and all, I, all you have to do is pip install it. All of these are in my requirements file. Just like that. Uh, PyQt Py is what I would consider more like native friendly GUI. So like when you make an app in 
like on your Mac, you know, it has like certain things, it looks a certain way, like, like this is very Mac-ish, right? But if I opened it in Windows, like this is gonna look different. Everything's gonna look a little, a little, a little stronger. Um, it, it will be, have more native look and feel to it. It's a little bit harder to get set up with. And when you go to an enterprise level and you start distributing it, you may have to pay for a license. So like definitely be aware of whatever library you're using with the license restrictions behind it. Um, Pi installer, so like I've made my project, it runs and installs, I know it's good, but my end user doesn't want to type Python blah blah blah. They want to click on something, right? They, they want an executable, they want something to install, you want to distribute. That's where Pi installer comes in. Uh, that will allow you to make both Mac and, uh, and Windows uh, executables. CX Freeze as well. It'll also CX Freeze is harder to use, but you can use it to make installers. So if there's like if your app needs a lot of permissions and read and write, and you have a lot of locked on your computer, you might need to install it with certain permissions, and you want that installer GUI. CX Freeze will do that. Uh, packaging PyPy is how we do that. So when you type pip installer, or someone has hosted their library on PyPy. to how to choose the way home. Please chime in if you have other thoughts on this. But there are so many libraries. I've just told you about quite a few of them. And even more, like probably going through your head if you're aware of Python. How do you choose it? Like you could spend a lot of time going back and forth with something like, this library is the best. No, I like this one. No, I like this one. How do you evaluate them? I look for usage, like number of downloads, like how many people like in the past and now, like what's the trend like? Is this library going to drop off the face of the earth in a month, or is it actually going to be something that's around? And I didn't put it on here, but is it versioned? That seems, you know, pretty intuitive, but like if there's no versioning, that's, that's a huge red flag to me that they're not doing patching right, they're not updating. The next time someone wants an update, you know, it might break their existing framework, so you, so you want something that has those things. Yeah? I don't pay attention. How do you find the number of downloads? You can usually get that from PyPy. If you use JavaScript, there's npm registry. There's, you, yeah, I think those are the main things. It'll tell you like number of downloads per year, per month, um, on that side as well. P-Y-P-I. Oh, P-Y-P-I. Um, the next one for me is responsiveness to, responsiveness to issues from the community. So like, if I went to a GitHub, if there were any issues here, Oh, let's go to like a nice library. Only because I have a reactive on there. Okay. Registered in the issues. 399. That's not a problem. There could be lots of issues uh, because maybe just millions of people are using it and finding you know different use cases. But are they responding to them? Are they being tagged? Are they being dealt with? Um, that's the kind of thing I look at. And what kind of issues am I getting? Like, it doesn't work no matter what I do. It's insecure. Like, I'll look into these and see what's going on. And then I also look like how do the people who maintain this interact with those comments? Like, are they nice? Are they rude? Are they like, oh, it works for me. Screw you. Like, that is not a community or a library that I might want to adopt unless I absolutely have to. <laughs> Sometimes you're stuck. Active community, I've been talking about this a lot. Like, do they have, um, you know, a discourse? Do they have a place you can go and ask questions? Do they have meetups? Um, are they posting issues? You know, like, what's the engagement like from everybody? Um, both intermediate newbies, like, like how, how is the community organizing itself? Do they have a conference where people can go and learn more? For instance, PyCon, most of the major open source libraries are there. And even if you're a newbie, you could go into that room and you can make some of your first contributions to some of those really big libraries. You can meet the maintainer. Um, and that's really important, right? When you're thinking about like starting out, you kind of need those connections and you want to see those people face to face. Um, documentation, that is a huge one. If you don't have documentation, I'm gone. Um, otherwise, I have to go through all of your source code to figure out how to use it, right? Are you maintaining your documentation? Is it easy? Does it make sense? And you guys kind of have a nice lens to come from if you're starting, you know, your programming, like, what makes something easy for you to use, right? Like, when you, you 
bring out a new library, you read the README, what do you guys like to see? And you probably have the same opinions that I do, right? You're like, it should be really clear, really easy to read, it should tell me how to get started, all of those things, and it should be pretty up to date. Fit for your project. Again, you know, going back to the airplane versus car kind of thing, like, do you really need an airplane? Do you need to make things complicated, or can you use something off the shelf? Um, is it a personal local project, and I don't really care if it only has five subscribers to the library? Um, so really think about that. Does it need to be super secure? What's my audience? You know, start asking those kinds of questions. Preference, that one happens a lot. Again, for the data visualization library, it was like, wouldn't you like better? Um, you're gonna have to make some of those sort of judgment calls like as you start engaging with them as well. Uh, and then licensing, is it free to use for everybody? Do uh, you have to pay them? Can I distribute it? A lot of people will put that in their repo. License, is it a license file? Or is it MIT? There's a few pretty standard ones, but just make sure that it's free to use. Usually it says like, you can use it. If it breaks, it's not my fault. It's just like, you know, do not return kind of thing. As is. And yeah, that's how I would go about kind of uh, choosing the tool. Usually I'll make like, if there's a couple of good candidates, I'll maybe I'll do a proof of concept in both. And that way I've actually like used it before. Um, and that, that was my talk. Uh, yeah, follow me on Twitter, hit me up on LinkedIn, or you know, follow my GitHub. I'm always happy to like answer questions. I do a lot of hackathons and meetups downtown. I highly encourage you, you all to do that. Like have, have a lot of people that you connect with. Yeah. I did better than I thought. That was going to take me like 20 minutes. <laughs> do you guys have any questions? <coughs> um, how do you balance um, working with like, managing and managing the That's a super good question. Well, there's a lot of overlap, and it's my passion. <coughs> I actually found something like it. I just moved from Portland because of my roommates still love me, we're still friends, but I had like an EEG lab room set up on my kitchen table for about three months. And I would just go there and I would do it, I'd be so into it, and I'd have this on my head, and they're like, no, we want a kitchen table. <laughs> um, so I'm just, I'm very into it, and I, I'm really good at managing my time. So Nike's during the week right now, OHSU is like nights and weekends. I try to like do it to one day. Yeah, I don't know if I'm gonna do it forever for that long. But for right now, it feels like, like a good thing. Um, do you have any tips for like managing classes? Like, on my own? Yeah. Um, I guess it just goes back to some of the principles of LLP. You know, like, make sure what you're designing makes sense and it's encapsulated. Like, if I'm making a class for a cat, it should have certain variables. And it should know how to walk and how to do those sort of things, right? It should be intuitive when you have a class. Whatever you're modeling the objects, you should think about it as if like I was drawing it on a piece of paper, like how would I want that object to, to work and to interact. Also use magic methods. And if you don't know what those are, I highly recommend for you to Google it. You can make Python objects behave like built-ins. You can make the cat object iterable and have all of the things that like the built-in Python would give you by using magic methods, um, I don't really like it. All right, thanks. One in the back for a question. Uh, I was just gonna ask, um, are, did you come from the science background and you went into like the coding? Like, uh, yeah, yeah, I'll share a little bit. I did start in high school in tech club, full disclosure. Like I have been a forever nerd. <laughs> uh, but I, I did start in the sciences. I thought maybe when I started out I would be a doctor. And then I was like, you know, no, I love science, I want to do that. And then as I got into science, I was like, I really love programming. And I kept, like, wanting to know more. And I don't know, just like, I never thought it would be something I would continue in, but it just, like, told me that. So building on your journey a little bit, as you're transitioning from science to your current position as a senior uh, software engineer, what, uh, like, a portion of learning did you do from 
formal education or learning on the job or just kind of like going in after hours and reading the documentation and practicing? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think because I did, I didn't just go straight to Nike, I did an internship and then went out. I had a lot of opportunity to prove myself and to learn. Like I did do online courses um, and I could give a whole nother talk about my learning experience, but I'm very project oriented. Like I have a dream, I have an idea and I want to do it. And it doesn't matter what the barriers are, I'm going to do it. I'm going to hit my head against the keyboard until something comes out of it. That's what I do with BCI Pi. I mean, it's a, uh, there's a saying that's like, if at first you don't succeed, call it version one, and I did that. <laughs> and you just keep iterating, you keep trying. And also, I think when you're interested in something, um, it makes it a little easier to learn. So I encourage you all to do that. Yeah. So when you interviewed for Nike? They came they to me. Came, they came to you? Oh, okay. I was going to ask what kind of questions. We still had an interview. It was a long one. Yeah. And they asked like questions about Python, you know, what the global interpretal lock is. So part of using this scientific library means I have to do something called multiprocessing, because I want a lot of things to happen simultaneously at once and to use all of my processor in real memory. So you have to start thinking about like sending activities to one process and another. But if you thread it, a thread is a single unit of work. Python has something called the global integral lock that will prevent one action from happening while the other one finishes. But if one is timing critical and you just stopped it, your whole experiment is done with, right? So they asked me questions like that. You know, like you'd have to be really aware of Python and have hit that problem in a really, really good way. And they asked me a lot of questions about fit, what I would need. Um, yeah, there were some technical things. It wasn't the hardest technical interview I've ever had, but I thought all of their questions were. Any ideas of what like the small projects like you know like beginners we can start? Because sometimes I find it difficult to be like to come up with the idea. I'll be like, yeah, I want to do this project. Um, I don't know. I think that like me as a graduate, I just you know that's what I struggle with. Like, hey, I want to do this project, but then I don't know what to do. That's a struggle with me. Like, I have like people here even above me. And they're like. I want to make a SaaS company, I want to make tons of money, I want to do all these things, and they're like, I just have no freaking ideas. <laughs> and maybe that's not your job. So, so I would really encourage like those meetups, hackathons, where you're around like a diverse group of people, some of them from coding and non-coding backgrounds. Let them come up with some ideas. And, uh, you could be more of the technical side of that. You, they could be like the CEO dream person, and then you could be like the CTO coming in and be like, I'm an architect of like this, it's going to happen like this, I'm going to make your vision happen. So you don't really have to be the ideas person. You just you need to be in spaces where you know you're solving those kind of problems and other people do. For uh, web development, like, would you recommend going to meetups like before that and just like learning about Python and uh, everything you need for uh, web development? Or uh, would you also like uh, recommend this topic? Like in the breadth of Python, you know, there is a lot of choices. There's so much to learn. You could start. It could almost seem overwhelming. And so, too much. Too much choice. And that way, I would just say, it's true. go to these meetups. Just try different things. Like have a project in mind and use JK. Right? Like, like I said, with, with libraries that are as popular as this, I don't think your time will be wasted. And I think it will be time well spent. Um, and it really comes to personal preference. Like if you want to be a web developer. I might stick on that track a little bit more, explore the space. Uh, they have uh, Django specifically. Most of them have, like, if, if they do have good documentation, like a lot of these libraries that I mentioned do, they also have, like, a good getting started on the little walk to show you how to deploy a site, start it up, go through it. Alone or with people. I need people with me to, like, actually encourage me. But not everyone likes it. Well, thank you. That was awesome. Uh, what do you guys think?
be interesting, like, if we were to start posting, like, how the here happened. Like, I've never done one, so. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, they're alive. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, right. <laughs> Uh, 
What's the next act? We just finished the Nike last week. Like Nike. Is there like a website for it? Devhost.com. And those are online. Yeah. I highly recommend setting up your meetup. Great. Food, such cool things. Food, great drinks, good food. Great. You don't get that anywhere. No, no, no. So for me, I was like, I'm like, oh, you're going to be. Okay. So, I'm going to go ahead and watch it. Their computer science is just like science. 